This episode is brought to you by the Complete Concussion Management Continuing Education Platform, more specifically, the Level 1 course, Introductory Concussion Management for Healthcare Professionals. This course dives into the pathophysiology of acute concussion and covers all the things that happen inside the brain immediately upon impact and during the days and weeks that follow. We dive into metabolic dysregulation, blood flow impairments, autonomic nervous system dysfunctions, and heart rate variability, and much more. This course also examines the biomechanics of injury, looking at subconcussive impacts, as well as concussions themselves. We explore the research around concussion prevention protocols, and in particular take a really close look at neck strengthening protocols to examine the scientific evidence in support, or potentially against these programs. In the final module, we take a very close look at chronic traumatic encephalopathy, otherwise known as CTE. This is the long-term neurodegenerative disease that's thought to be attributed to concussions or repetitive head trauma. And we take a very in-depth look at the evidence uh, around this, and we try to separate media hype from the actual scientific literature. This allows you as a healthcare professional to be able to answer your patient's questions more clearly and appropriately with the best evidence in mind. This course is meant for healthcare professionals, but is no means excluded to healthcare professionals. We actually made this course open to anyone. Although the majority of people who are gonna be interested in taking it are going to be healthcare professionals, and we do discuss things at a very, very high level for healthcare professionals, but we also know that there's a lot of people who are seeking information for themselves, personally or for their family members or loved ones who currently have concussions and just want to learn more about the topic. By all means, you are also welcome to take this course. So please click the link below in the show notes for the level one course. Hello everyone, welcome to Ask Concussion Doc episode 64. Uh, first thing, just an announcement this Friday, September the 20th is National Concussion Awareness Day. Um, go to nationalconcussionawarenessday.com for more information on that. Um, this episode is based on all things imaging. Over the past uh, probably year or so, we've had a number of questions come in where pe- uh, patients will ask us, you know, I've had an MRI, I've had a CT scan, and they're normal. Does this mean that I don't have a concussion? And similarly, we get a lot of therapists, healthcare professionals uh, wondering if you know MRI imaging or anything helps us to um, determine concussion uh, if it has occurred or not. So I'm going to talk about the various types of imaging that can be done and what they can and cannot show. So that's what we're going to do today. Alrighty. Okay. So. First off, we have to know a little bit about what a concussion injury is. It's a functional injury, okay? So the structure of the brain remains intact, right? It's not like if you have a pulled muscle and you can actually go on there with an ultrasound and see that the muscle's been torn or pulled, or if you have an MRI, you can see that there's separation in the muscle, there's edema and there's swelling and all this other stuff. With concussion, you can't see that because it's a change in how the brain functions. So because of the impact or the insult that happens, the brain actually undergoes what's called a stretching and a shearing. So the brain tissue itself gets pulled and stretched. And when it gets pulled and stretched, it basically just creates a stimulation of the brain. And that stimulation creates all sorts of firing. And that's where a lot of the symptoms come from, uh, at least in the very initial stage. All of that firing, then starts to burn energy. And so the second phase of concussion is just this really, really low energy state. So the brain itself remains intact. That's why if you were to do imaging using structural imaging techniques like an MRI or like a CT scan or a CAT scan, you would just see a normal looking brain. Oftentimes, I've had patients that will come in and say, yeah, I had a CT scan done in the hospital and the doctor told me that I don't have a concussion. It's impossible to see a concussion on a CT scan. The purpose of doing a CT scan is to look for something more serious, like a brain bleed or swelling or a fracture in the skull or something like that. So just because the doctor says that your image is clear 
doesn't mean that you don't have a concussion injury because you can't see the concussion injury. If your scan is clear, it means that you don't have something more serious than a concussion. And that's really the whole point of doing these images in the hospital initially is just to make sure that there isn't a bleed or something more serious. But concussion, like I said, is a functional injury. So you can't see it on an MRI or CT scan. Now this is, I don't think this is led to, but now we have these new fancy tools that actually look at brain function. So they'll look at, and they'll use various techniques to look at how the brain is functioning, which gives us a little bit more insight into, you know, possible concussion mechanisms and, you know, possible objective evidence of concussion actually occurring. Because right now we have no way to confirm that a concussion has actually occurred at all. We really have no way to do that. So I'm going to talk about some functional imaging techniques. The first one that people may be familiar with is what's called an fMRI or a functional MRI. And what a functional MRI does is it looks at blood oxygen levels. So it looks at oxygen usage essentially in tissue based on um, the flow of blood and oxygen to that area. So if a tissue is more active, let's say in your brain, if certain areas of your brain are becoming activated for whatever reason, um, blood will typically shunt to that area and so you'll get more blood flow to that area, more oxygen usage, more oxygen uptake, and that will appear as a hot signal on an fMRI scanner. So typically what they'll do, there's two ways of doing this. One is what's called a resting state fMRI and the other one's called a task-based or task-oriented fMRI. And the resting state is they'll just put you in the tube and they won't give you any typical instructions to do anything. You'll just kind of be sitting in a resting state. So whatever thought patterns emerge or whatever like that, that'll show just the different signals that are happening within the brain. Task-based is they'll actually give you, uh, usually it's through a set of goggles or something where they'll give you a task to do. You know, they'll flash something and then they'll ask you, you know, did you see this image previously? And you'll hit a button if the answer is yes. And they'll take you through a series of memory tasks and concentration tasks and executive function tasks while you're in the fMRI because then it's looking at different activation patterns of the brain. And so with concussion, um, we have found, and this kind of led to um, some of the discovery around uh, what's called the default mode network, which is kind of uh, was also known as your ego, but it's kind of your self-talk, your day-to-day. -day. Um, it's what allows you to be anxious or excited or depressed or you know have fond memories of a certain thing. So it's kind of your sense of self, your self-talk. It's called the default mode network, which has become very important in concussion. And if you're not sure what the default mode network is, I did a whole talk of it on, I think, episode 50, which is on neuro fatigue and how the default mode network plays into that. But the way that we're able to visualize that uh, is often through fMRI studies. The problem with fMRI, as you'll see as we go through a lot of these functional imaging um, uh, modalities, is that it is very non-specific meaning that there isn't a specific pattern that we see with concussion. Patients with chronic concussion symptoms look a lot like a lot of different conditions. So for example, similar findings as fMRI have been found in patients with anxiety, chronic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, chronic pain, and a variety of other conditions. So the problem because it becomes, if you look at somebody with a concussion or persistent concussion symptoms, and then you look at somebody that's never had a concussion but has, an anxi has generalized anxiety, those two will look very similar. So if we see somebody with this patterning in their brain, are we assuming this is due to concussion? Has this person now developed an anxiety disorder and that's what we're picking up? Does this person have post-traumatic stress from a car accident that originally caused the brain injury, but now they're dealing more with PTSD? Um, are they suffering from chronic pain? Do they have pain elsewhere in their body that's causing their brain pattern to activate in this way? We don't know. So that's what makes it challenging for using any type of functional imaging. So these are currently non-diagnostic. You can't just get a functional MRI and say, oh, here it is, this is my issue, this indicates brain injury. Really what it is is, oh, this is it. This could indicate a variety of things uh, like PTSD, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? 
compared to normal healthy, yes, you might find differences, but in order to figure out what is actually causing it, uh, we still don't know, and unfortunately, fMRI can't currently tell us that. Next one is called SPECT, S-P-E-C-T. It's an acronym, and it is Single Positron Emission computed tomography or CT scan. So it's a type of CT scan. And what happens is they inject a radionucleotide tracer, radioactive nu uh, tracer into your body, which then goes and follows um, your blood vessels and kind of looks at blood flow in various tissues. So if you look at concussion studies specifically in patients with persistent concussion symptoms, we've found changes in SPECT up to five and a half years after concussion. So potentially blood perfusion in the brain problems five and a half years after the concussion has actually taken place. All right, so sounds very promising. Again, let's get into the problems. Similar, similar cerebral perfusion um, findings have been found in patients with low back pain patients with neck pain, patients with whiplash, patients uh, with upper thoracic or upper back pain, uh, patients with depression, patients with chronic fatigue, and a whole bunch of other things, right? So just because we find these findings on a spec scan and we say, oh, there's decreased cerebral perfusion, it must be due to their concussion, not necessarily. It could be due to the fact that they may be depressed. They may have pain elsewhere in their body. They may have had you know, neck injury. We don't know. Right, so all sorts of things can lead to decreased perfusion in the brain. So again, not really sure. Compared to normal, we see a difference. Compared to other conditions, we may not necessarily see a difference. So what are we really looking at? We don't know. Diffusion tensor imaging, this one has uh, gained a lot of attention because it produces nice, colorful, pretty pictures. Uh, and if you've seen a diffusion tensor scan, they look really cool. They'll show, uh, and really what a diffusion tensor, it looks at the white matter of the brain, so it looks at the axons themselves. So if you see a diffusion tensor scan, it'll have these colorful patterns that follow like individual axon tracks, and they look amazing. And so what this is looking at is actually the diffusion or the flow of water molecules either perpendicular to or in alignment with the axon or, uh, or sorry, in alignment or parallel to the axon or perpendicular to the axon. The idea is that if you have this axon, which is like a long tube, and inside that tube you have structural proteins called microtubules and neurofilaments, and those are what allow the cell to communicate within itself. So to send nutrients from one end of the cell to the other, or signaling proteins from one end of the cell to the other, it has to flow along these neurofilaments and microtubules. So you'll also have like flow and diffusion of water. If the axon is intact, if this tube is intact and undamaged, the thought is that water will typically flow only along the axon. It can't flow perpendicular because it's constrained by the borders of the axon itself. So you get this, this parallel diffusion type of thing, okay? In the event of injury, or at least the theory is that Swelling in the axon will cause all sorts of haphazard water movement. Uh, breakdown of the myelin sheath of the axon itself will, will cause or will prevent the constrainment of water, which will allow it to flow out of the axon. So again, you get more perpendicular or radial diffusion happening after an injury has taken place, and you get less of just one directional um, water flow. So that's the idea, is that if there's damage to these microtubules, this microstructural damage, you wouldn't see it on an MRI or a CT scan, but if you looked right into the axon and were able to look at the flow of water, you could potentially pick up this, what's called microstructural damage, meaning it's below you know, the structure, it's internal cellular damage, um, not necessarily full-on brain damage. So DTI has been promising for this reason because it can look right at the axons themselves, and this has been thought to be a, a deeper axon white matter injury for a long time. Um, so that's the thought, but here's some problems, and I have some studies to talk about. 
Uh, this is a systematic review that was done in 2017 by Breton Askin. And what they uncovered is that these same findings in DTI are found in a number of different issues. So uh, number one, um, low socioeconomic status. Patients with low socioeconomic status will have similar patterns of diffusion tensor findings as patients with concussion. Interesting. Patients with major depressive disorder will have similar findings as diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, patients with ADHD will have similar findings as concussion uh, on their diffusion tensor scans. Another study by Wild et al. in 2018 I'm just going to read this quote. When compared to an orthopedically injured group, meaning somebody with an injury somewhere else in their body, concussion showed no differences in diffusion metrics within 96 hours or three months after injury. However, both groups, concussion and orthopedic injury, showed differences from controls. So when you compare somebody with an orthopedic injury to somebody with a concussion, there's no difference. Injury in general may cause changes in their diffusion metrics. Pain may cause changes in their diffusion metrics. But when you compare each one of them to somebody without pain and a normal healthy, it, there shows differences. So a lot of the studies that are done using diffusion tensor are actually flawed in their design because what they do is they look at somebody with a concussion and somebody with nothing. So automatically there's differences. When we start comparing concussion to other things like depression, like orthopedic injuries, like chronic pain, like whatever else, you see that there really is no difference. So what are we really looking at? I'm going to continue with this. Overall, the results indicate that both groups of patients with traumatic injuries, regardless of whether the injury resulted in head injury, exhibited similarly altered subacute diffusion characteristics in the white matter regions compared with the non-injured comparison group, and that these differences generally persisted three months later. It may be that trauma-related issues obscure or confound differences that are attributed to head injury itself. Methods to decrease the variability in measurement and increase the sensitivity of neuroimaging to change will be necessary to better discern the effects of head injury. And actually, there was just a recent study that came out. Uh, I can't remember where it was published, but it came out recently and just said, we should not be using diffusion tensor imaging yet to provide individual diagnostic, prognostic, or management decisions. Because once you take a DTI image, just because you see something doesn't mean that it's concussion. Because it could be a whole bunch of other things and we have no idea uh, which one it is. So again, tough. Another type of image is called spectroscopy. This is a magnetic resonance image, so it's an MRI type technology, and it's magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And what it does is it looks at metabolites in different tissues. The main metabolite that's of interest in concussion, uh, well, there's a few of them, but the one that I really like is NAA or N-acetyl aspartate. The reason I like NAA is because it's found to have a high correlation with ATP. ATP is the energy molecule in your brain. So like I said, you get all this firing initially when a concussion happens, then you get a drop in energy. Well, how do we measure that drop in energy? Well, we're looking really at ATP, but we can't measure ATP. So the best thing we have is to measure NAA, which is correlated with ATP in a very high way. So if we could actually see this energy drop and see when it recovers, well, that's valuable information. And a lot of the studies that have been done in this have been done in animals, and they find that actually in this low energy phase is where the brain is very vulnerable. So this to me is the most important thing. When are we out of that vulnerable period, right? When are we safe to return to our activities? When are we safe to go back to contact? That's really the important piece to me as a clinician managing athletes going back into sport participation is when are they safe to do so? So that's where spectroscopy is very interesting. There was a large study done in Italy and it showed that this recovery period, uh, actually there's a few studies, some of them showed between 22 and 30 days for that to fully recover. Other studies showed up to 45 days for that to fully recover, but there's potentially some variability here in people and so we really don't know in terms of that. But we do know from those studies that the recovery is longer than the thought, you know, seven to 10 day period where symptoms are usually, it just shows us a little bit more. So that one to me is the most interesting, but 
the problems with that one is that there's limited research so we don't know what exactly other conditions might cause these same types of findings. Uh, we do know that things like stroke and damage to the brain causes the same types of drops in NAA, but we don't know if those same findings are found in things like depression, etc. So we have to do more research. Also, these imaging things can be very difficult to interpret. So I know that there's not a lot of people even doing research in it because it is quite confusing and difficult to, uh, to do. Last but not least on our list is PET scans, which is positron emission tomography. Uh, and this is currently being looked at for the long-term effects following concussion. So with what, what a PET scan is, is again, it's kind of a CT scan, but they inject a radionucleotide, which is um, like a radioactive dye that goes around and each one will bind to specific things. So it'll go and attach itself to specific you know, compounds and then they'll take an image and then whatever this, wherever this compound is will light up on the scanner. So they'll be able to find things. And so there's a particular radionucleotide that I've seen in most of these studies called FDDNP and they'll inject this into patients that have a history of, um, you know, sports participation, multiple concussions and they'll look at this and then what the FDDNP binds to is tau protein which is what they're finding in the brains of, well, a number of different conditions, Alzheimer's being one, but CTE is the other one that's of interest in the concussion world. So they inject this radionucleotide, it goes around, it binds to tau protein, then they take a CT scan, and if you have tau protein, all these areas will light up in the brain. So the hope is, with enough research, we can actually confirm that this is actually what we're finding, and we don't have that research yet. But the goal is to eventually be able to diagnose somebody with CTE before they die. Because right now, CTE is purely a post-mortem diagnosis. So um, we don't know until we actually do a full autopsy and do brain staining and things like that to actually find that protein. And so a little bit more research has to be done in this, but I know that there's groups uh, in California. Uh, I know Julian Bale's group is working on, on this, and I've seen a couple studies from them. Bennett Amalu, who was made famous by the, the movie Concussion, um, uh, his group's done some stuff as well. So People are looking into this and I've seen it uh, in a few kind of smaller studies. So uh, interesting, pay attention. So again, we have a number of different types of imaging modalities. MRI, CT scan aren't gonna do anything for you on the concussion respect. What they're looking for is more serious injuries. So just because it's clean doesn't mean that you didn't have a concussion. When you get into the functional imaging side of things, all of these imaging tools right now are research tools. They're not supposed to be used clinically because we don't know enough about them. We don't know if it's, we don't know the patterning. We don't know if we can specifically diagnose concussion with it because it could mean a variety of different things. Just because you have findings, it's really, it doesn't help us at all. So these are research tools and basically should only be looked at or viewed as such. So concussion still remains, unfortunately, a clinical diagnosis where we have to find out what's driving the symptoms and then treat appropriately based on that. So don't be looking for the MRI, don't be looking for the scan that's gonna prove anything for you because we're just not quite there yet. Any questions coming on these? No questions. no questions. Jeez. All right, see you guys, happy Wednesday. Cheers, see you next week, all that good stuff. If you have questions, send them in. Are you suffering from concussion symptoms that just aren't getting better? Maybe you're in the wrong place. Maybe you're seeing the wrong healthcare professional. Visit completeconcussion.com slash find dash a dash clinic to find all the local professionally trained concussion rehab individuals in your area. Each of our partnered clinics have gone through extensive training on concussion assessment, management, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation. Uh, they're going to work with you to try and find the root cause of your symptoms and then develop a treatment plan and approach to help get rid of them. If you don't know what's driving the symptoms, you can't ever help or hope to fix them. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. They have a 98% patient satisfaction rating and have a higher net promoter score than Amazon, Apple, and Netflix. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. You will not regret it.